always walked his own road, both personally and professionally. Most people march to a different drum. This man marches to a different band. After dodging more than his share of uh, landmines along the way, he is back better than ever. And I'm happy to welcome Mr. Blake, uh, following his birthday on September 18th, back to our program here at CBS. How do you like the way you look over there on that TV monitor? You're really looking at yourself, aren't you? I look like somebody that you visit on the weekend. <laughs> you know, we have to go up to a Tascadero and bring, bring Robert some fruit and vegetables. Hi, Robert, how are you? You know, I'm pretty soon going to be through working with the, the basket weaving. I get to use the leather tools next week. I get to use sharp tools. You want to come back? And I look crazy. Well, I look like I belong in the funny farm. I don't feel like I look. I look like somebody that should be behind wire. And you say, somebody get a, 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 a suitcase for him to play with. How, how about, how about with behind glass and we talk on each, hey, each other on a phone? Next time I come here, yes, sir. I want that guy Bernard gone. <laughs> you got it. He's a pain in the ass. He comes in your dress room and bothers you. He thinks he's working on your ego or doing something, you know, like I fell off a banana boat last week and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Now you're going to be all right. Now, you know, Tom really likes you. He really, don't say nothing about his hair, but he really likes you. I want you to get in the spirit of it now. Have a good time with it. You know, you can always tell a sign of a total amateur director. When you walk on a set, uh -huh. you get ready to do a scene, and he says, now, I want you to really feel it. I yeah, want right. you to really right, get into right, it. Right, right, right. Ru really? That's the best way to make me feel it, is to tell me to feel it. You... <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, no, Bernard's cool. <laughs> but get him another job. We already have done that, I sir. Know. The last I know. time you he were here... He told me he's going to blow the hell out of here and get a decent job. <laughs> <laughs> the last time you... Where's were... the audience? Oh, the, the, the ladies with blue hair. Who produces this show, man? I've got to talk to somebody beside you to get this show into more of a showbiz mode. You know, that guy on Channel 4 there, you could beat him. You could have entertaining people here. You could have Tony Bennett sing it, sitting here. You have true. a little audience, half a dozen people. What's the point of telling the joke if there's nobody to laugh? Well, there's a whole crew here, little... and there are some people They're over here. They're all sitting over there in the coma. First of all, it's freezing in here. For... They're all like this. I'm going to try to make them laugh. They're having a tough time breathing. Remember, you wanted ladies with blue hair all around. I just want some people here. I'm used to being in show business. I don't want the show to be like that guy with the suspenders where he asks real profound, dumb questions, <laughs> and everybody sits around listening. I'm my, 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 my yeah, yeah, show, show business. Business. Right, exactly right. You can't get Mickey Rooney to come and sit in this chair without this is an true. audience. This is true. I'm being kind to you. There is a method to our madness, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no wonder you wind up with nothing but people that write books about bacon goods and shit yeah, like and, that. And, and, and guys who, and guys who should here. be behind wire, right. <laughs> now, the last, the last... I'm trying to make the show funny. Don't take it poisonous and start attacking me I'm here. not attacking you. You sure? The last time you were you here... Me. You... <laughs> What? The last time you were here, you said that you were smoking up until June 1st. Remember, this was back in May. Yes. And then you were going to quit. June 1st, July, August. Well, I didn't make it that. I have now officially not smoked 800, 850 cigarettes. Come next week, it'll be 1,000 cigarettes I haven't smoked. About four weeks. Yeah. Yep. What I'm doing is counting the cigarettes that, that I don't that, smoke. That you don't smoke. By yeah. the way, a lot of people do that. That's amazing, man. Just think of a thousand cigarettes piled up. You know what? I want to smoke, though. I'm a smoker. I will never be a non-smoker, a healed smoker, a cured smoker. A reformed I will smoker. always be a smoker who hopefully doesn't smoke. There you go. There you go. The drag is, if smoking made you sick, I would do it, but it kills you. You know, something else. Well, you're going to get sick, high yeah. blood pressure if you do that, or your feet are going to rot. But it doesn't do those things. It kills you. It kills you. Yeah. You're fine, and then you fall over dead. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I decided I don't want to die by my own hand. Unless I have to do this show a lot. Oh, stop. <laughs> and the other thing we talked about the last time you were, here, you were here was your visit to your dad's grave. Remember we talked about your dad and the fact that he and you and he had a... Now, you, see, this is pure wizardry. We were on a roll. We had some funny stuff going. Now we're going to go directly into the tank with my father's grave. I'm just teasing you, man. I know you are, man. I'm just teasing you. I know you, you are. You've got to learn to have a little fun because I'm old and crazy and arrogant and I get to do anything I want. That's correct. My father, my father. Do you have a lot of money in the bank? You know, whenever you're in front of the box, there's always money there. <laughs> right. As long as you don't spend it, it's all like Monopoly money. Yeah. 
You know, because, yeah, I got dough. That's good. But I mean, I had dough, and I, there's always money. But the good thing when about... When you're acting, there's money. Yeah, but the good thing about dough is you can say anything you want to anybody, and there's very little consequence, right? When you're crazy, you can do that anyway. That's true, yeah, but it helps to have a little dough. I mean, I don't care who thinks what about what, man. The sky has fallen, the world is ending. I didn't give a damn what people thought of me when I was young and worried about raising my kids. I'm going to care now? I mean, <laughs> We're lucky if we last another 20 years on this planet Tell me about before it. we eat each other. And I'm going to worry about what somebody thinks? Well, listen, we don't have to worry about that anymore anyway, because I've turned the baton over to, to Ed Begley Jr. and Barbara Streisand, and they're going to make sure that politically everything works out great, <laughs> so I can just uh, lay back and I don't have to do that <laughs> The world anymore. is safe for democracy. Stopping the wars and getting cracked over the head. My father, I went to his grave. I went to his grave. And you know, it was weird, man. Uh, I couldn't find it because there was no stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I had to go check and uh, they had to look up all this kind of stuff. Can you imagine, man, that cat's been in the ground since 1955 and nobody ever went to see him? A rose, nothing. There was no grave. Mm -hmm. And so we had to find it. And then I bought him a stone, and then I went back and uh, put some flowers on it, and then I put some peanuts and stuff like that on it so the birds and the squirrels would come and hang out with him when I wasn't there, because I don't figure there's a whole lot of people going to go see him. And uh, life is very weird when you let go of the scorecard. You know, I've spent my whole life Keeping Keep score. score. I know what you mean. And I'm Italian. And I get revenge, man. Whatever happens, you're marked. Don't don't get mad, get even. Watch out. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. Because I may wait till your life is really great before I take you out. But it's different now. I can't remember. You know, it's like the burden of trying to remember who I'm supposed to hate and be mad at. I got tired of it. Uh, but it's scary. Because then you start feeling stuff you know it's hard to admit that the one thing i wanted in this whole world was to make that old man happy when i was two years old i wanted to make him happy i wanted him to be a movie star i wanted him to be something and he couldn't do it every time i brought him into the sunlight he got scared and then he'd have to go back again but you know i covered it up with all that hate and rage and you know, I'll rip a hole in your throat and suck your heart out because I just, nobody's going to... You say, wow, man. All I ever wanted to do was hug him and say, it's going to be all right, Pop, don't worry. That's awful, ain't it? No, it's neat. You know what I think about, about you know, my dad's been gone now for uh, 22 years. And I think, like, you're a known person and I'm a known person. Nobody ever knew our fathers, Bob. Uh, our, our fathers mm. left no footprints on the sands of time. You know, you know what I'm saying to you? None. You know, nobody knows Frank Snyder, my father. Nobody knows your father, whatever his name was. I mean, they, they just, they lived and they did their thing as best they could, at least in my father's case. And they died, and they're gone. They're just gone. Do you sometimes wish that he was around? Oh, sure. To say, hey, look yeah. what's going on. Yeah. I ain't on death row. <laughs> I ain't on skid row. You know, I'm here. And there's people out there that even like me. Oh, for all the times he told me as a kid, you know, because my father wanted for me to be a doctor. You know, his, his brother-in-law was a doctor. And the doctor drove Lincolns and we drove Chevys. And he figured if his kid was a doctor, his, his, his kid would drive Lincolns or Cadillacs. And when I didn't make it through med school, he was very, very disappointed. And I told him I wanted to go into radio. He said, well, what are you gonna, what, how are you going to make any money in radio? And I kind of wish you were around to say, hey, Pa, you can make a pretty good, good buck in radio, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, my father was uh, a little different, but... Uh, As you said the last time. But he you... was my father. That's the gag, he was my father. You know, you only get one of those. And uh, sometimes it hurts a lot how much you miss if it don't turn out right. But that's okay. Anyway, we're with, right. we're with Robert Blake here. I have to call a halt for a I want seconds. an audience next time. There's going to be an audience out here. I don't care if you go to a, the, an undertaker and get four stiffs and prop them up. <laughs> I want somebody to tell we, a joke we, to. We've had our share of those already. <laughs> <I think. laughs> Robert, Robert Blake and you on the toll-free after this break. The toll-free. <laughs> the 
that you were asked by somebody uh, to write a book about the little rascals because there's nobody left to write the book about. Ain't that a drag? No, it's, uh, why you is it a drag? Like? That's a wonderful thing. I mean, you, you have in your head a little piece of history that makes America, America, that you, that you can share with people. And, yeah, and but we'll when give you us a look at it, that, and we'll, we'll give us a look at the thing that only Bob Blake knows about. All right, let me give you a little half-assed education. Okay, yes, sir. When you compound that by 60 years of the Little Rascals, you're looking at somebody who feels like they belong in the La Brea tar pits. You know, there's nobody around like me unless they're 90 years old and in the motion picture home or underground. There are people older than me. There's Paul Newman or Clint Eastwood or somebody, and they're big stars. But they weren't here back in the 30s. When saying. somebody comes up and says, God, you worked with Spencer Tracy. Yeah. That would be cool if it was just that I worked with Spencer Tracy. But then somebody else says, well, you were in the Rascals. Well, you did Little Beaver, and you knew Gene Autry. And, and pretty soon they say, boy, you know what it's like to live inside of this, this thing? You know, the other day they I came, would think, they, they I asked I think me, it would be like living in, uh, 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 at, no. the, at, at the carnival. At the, I think it would be like living in fairyland no. to live where you've lived. No. And I know there's a dark side to it, but when you mentioned, like, you knew Bogart, you knew Tracy, you were at MGM in the halcyon years when, when you knew... Uh, I was on he, the yellow brick road playing with, the with Judy Garland, okay, and Donald O'Connor, and Gene Kelly, and uh, John Houston, Elizabeth yeah. Taylor. I mean, the candy store that you got to work in, most people want to know about that. They want, they, yeah, they, they see, want to see it through your eyes. It's a candy store to you because I get to tell you about it. But when you walk around with that, it's like, I don't know, man. It's just very weird to go and get an award. The treasure of Sierra Madre was put in the Hall of Fame. Yes, sir. And they asked me to go and accept the award. And when I got there, I said, why didn't you have Lauren Bacall or somebody? Because no, she wasn't connected with the movie. You're the only person alive that was connected with the movie. You know what that feels like when everybody is dead but you? Remember that, that, that yes, movie I, when you were standing way. up there on the wall and you keep propping up all the dead guys and shooting over them? What's the name of that movie? You guys ain't old enough. Bo Jess. Yeah, Bo Jess. That's what I feel like. I feel like somebody should stuff me and put me up on a wall someplace. It's weird, man. Let me it ain't you. a lot of fun to walk oh, around come like on. that. Now, let me tell you a funny little story here. There's, oh, a, there, there's, okay. a little, there's a little TV station here in Los Angeles, KTLA, right? Channel 5. You probably watch the news on Channel 5 or you see KTLA. For 11 jillion years. Okay, fine. Next year, they are celebrating their 50th anniversary on the air. They've been on the yeah. air since 1947, the first commercial television station in Western City. I when I, when I worked there, I, 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 I only worked there for two years of my life. It was yeah. not the highlight of my career, but I worked with the late Bill Stout, okay, legendary journalist and broadcaster in this town. I worked with the late Terry Drinkwater, a courageous CBS News correspondent, okay, and others uh, who, who, who have gone on. Yeah. So they called me about uh, a month ago, a friend of mine, he said, would you host the show? I said, well, why would I host that show? I said, I was only there two years. He says, you're the only one left. I thought, good for me. Not, not, not a bummer that the others have all died, but, geez, good for me. And I, I, I want you to feel that way, too. Good for you, Blake, that you're still here. I'm going to try this one more time. I know you are, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to get it. I know. You were in the 50s. I had two gold watches by then for the years that I put in. I'm comfortable around Mickey Rooney. I'm comfortable around people who've been where I've been, not people who want to hear about where I've been. You know, it's like that like that movie about the old gunfighter and the West is gone and he's this last guy and he knows he's going to die anybody and everybody says, well, what was it like in the old days? And the guy says, leave me alone. Just leave me alone, pal. Sometimes you just feel that way. You get tired of telling people what it was like in the old days. Gotcha, gotcha. It's, 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 a, it's a strange place to be. I guess you're not going to write the book about the little rascals. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of ambivalence. Because on the one hand, I would like to write the book because I'm sick of all the lies and junk that I hear about the rascals and, and, and Alfie and Bucky and all those people. And, and, and I, I would like, I w out of respect for them, I would like to tell everybody who they were and what they were. Because they weren't monkeys. They were human beings. Most of them tragic human beings who died very young, and I should have been there with them dying, but somehow or other I snuck by. They were killed, they died of drugs, all kinds of things, and I would like to 
put their lives down so that people would have a respect for them, for who they were and what they were. The same with the Dead End Kids and some other people that I knew. Like I said, I guess you're going to be writing the book about the little rest. Probably not. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I want to tell you, to get a yes or a no out of you is impossible. We will continue with Robert Blake and you on the toll free as time permits <laughs> after these messages. What did you do in your uh, military career? <laughs> <laughs> I understand that you really love the military. <laughs> well, from your first draft inspection to the day you mustered out. <laughs> I, they drafted me. I didn't go, and some guys showed up at my house where I was living, and I was in bed hungover, and they said, you're going to jail or you're going in the Army, and I went uh, with them downtown, hungover and sick as a dog. And I, I went cannot in the imagine infantry. you hungover, sir. I went in the infantry, and uh, while I was in basic training, the Korean War was over, so they sent us to Alaska. I hated the service. I mean, I didn't know that. But... I got out of it alive. The truth of the matter is that uh, I, I almost wound up in Leavenworth for life in prison, and a priest got me off the hook on statutory rape, and that's the facts. Oh, man. My hand on the head of my daughter, if I'm lying, I almost went to federal prison for the rest of my life for statutory rape, and a priest got me off the hook. You know, you said a while back that if your dad were here, you could say to him, look, I'm not on skid row, I'm not on death row. Every now and again when you look in the mirror, do you wonder how you escaped skid row? How you yeah. escaped uh, uh, There's no question. There's no question that I'm a miracle. There is no question. It has nothing to do with wisdom or guts or courage or anything like that. I should have been dead a thousand times over. And you're not. And there, and there's, uh, there must be a reason and for And I that. keep saying, boss, what is it you're keeping me here for? What I'm supposed to do? Well, we'll see. Maybe I'm supposed to write that book. Maybe. Or maybe I'm supposed to go out there and tell kids to have a little hope. Or all them people that used to be called the middle class that we destroy by exporting jobs and importing labor. You know, the only thing that really made America great was the fact that we had a legitimate middle class. That's correct. And we're the only civilization in 4,000 years that had a middle class. And in the past 20 or 30 years, we eliminated it. You Just know what we did to the middle poor. class that was a terrible mistake besides exporting all the jobs? You remember when you could deduct, like, credit card interest, and you could deduct the interest on your car? Yeah. And every, oh, every May or June, the average middle-class family would get a tax refund of $2,500. Yeah. And that was their summer vacation. Or that was the tuition for the kid for college the next year. Or that was a new car for mom and dad. But now we disallowed all those deductions, and there are no more refund checks. There is no, there is no oh. American dream. If you don't have a middle class, you can't have an American dream. So we got people sleeping in the streets. And they call them homeless. See, once you call somebody homeless, then you're off the hook from being responsible. That's right. And you can throw them a few bucks. When you call them jobless, which is what they are, all the people out there have one thing in common. They don't have a job. No job. That's the bottom line. Some of them are drunk, some of them are sober, some are smart, some are dumb, some but are educated. None, none of them have, none any of them have a job. No income, no job. And right. that, so we call them homeless because nobody wants to pay attention to the fact that we took their jobs away from them because that's the bottom line. They ain't got no jobs. In 10 years, this city will be like Mexico City, where you got tens of thousands of people sleeping out there on the edge of town. Unless they have jobs. Unless yeah. somebody soon turns no this town. thing around. Ain't going to be no jobs because there ain't no America because the, 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 the jillions of dollars that go into the international complex of all of it has nothing to do with who has a job in America. It has to do with who owns the stock and how much is the stock worth. And can we make cheaper product if we send the factory right. to South America? Then send it to South America and let that bum sweep floors. That's why 80% of the families now live in apartments and old people live in houses. You know, you notice how you walk down the street and there's no kids playing in the streets? Nobody out in front of the house? Yeah. There yeah. ain't even a swing hanging in a tree because there's two old geezers living in there because the young people got to have uh, nothing but apartments. And it takes three paychecks to even try to break even. What am I talking about that for? I've given up all that. That's all Ed Begley and Barbara Streisand will fix it. I'm through. I don't do that anymore. I, 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 I want to ask you here, and we talked about this in one of the breaks. Was the, was the bird fun on Beretta? Remember, you, you told me a couple of stories. About, was there any fun with that bird? It depends. The, some of the birds, like the bird who flew was cute. Yeah. And I would see you with Johnny Carson with the bird. Carson that I the took bird. on Carson, yeah. he was cute because yeah. he did tricks. Yeah. Here's the bird. He walks down this way and he does that. But the bird that was the genius, 
the bird that in, 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 in the middle of a scene, I say, wait, this scene is dull. It ain't working. So in the middle of it, when I look the other way, have the bird come in and get some Kleenex and blow his nose. That bird in five minutes You're kidding. would do it. That You're bird kidding. was not trained. It was a, it was a person. Smart bird. Say, yeah. I want you to take the eight ball and run it down into the corner pocket. Don't put it in the side pocket. And I don't want the blue ball to go in. I want the eight ball in that pocket. First take bump in the pocket. But that bird would tear your hands oh, yeah. off because he was very tem temperamental, as most geniuses are. That's right. That's right. And if you look cross-eyed at him, or if he was just in a bad mood, or he didn't get laid, or whatever, he'd grab your finger and look you in the eye and say, "You know, I could eat this finger." You say, "Yes, sir. I know you could eat that finger. Please don't do it because my career is just budding. Don't I need one?" So that bird was tough. Yeah, yeah. But the rest of them were fun. Show birds. Listen, I'm going to let you go for now. But the next time, I don't blame you. Yeah. <laughs> but the next time you come back. Cute. I'm bringing my own audience no, next no. time. I, I promise. I've never used your lemo yet. I'm using the lemo next time. When you pick me up, you're going to pick up a half a dozen people first and put some folding chairs there for them. Yes, sir. And would you like some around here, too? No, because that's your department. I just want a few over oh, here. Over, where you you can... don't need an audience. I need an okay. audience. Okay, you want five or six folding right chairs there. right there where you can that's see them, it. where your monitor is. That way I can okay. get off of you for a while in that green tie. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> I like you a lot, pal. Thank you for Take having care. me. Take care. My really? great pleasure. Robert Blake uh, uh, is our guest. We'll continue with Sally Jenkins and talk about sports, men, boys, and women. And now Blake is giving it one of these. <laughs> sports, men, boys, and women. Whatever. I've got stuff in my mouth and it hurts. Right.